We're sitting here today in the old federal district courtroom at 421 Gold with uh, federal district judge James A. Parker. I want to thank Judge Parker, one, for making himself available to us to provide uh, a very interesting oral history for the New Mexico Senior Lawyers Project and also to tell us a little bit about his courtroom. Uh, with your consent, I would like to start off a little bit with your background, Judge. Uh, where were you born? Tom, I was born in uh, Houston, Texas in 1937. Uh, Did you I'm grow up the, there? I grew up in Houston. I was one of the Depression babies, which is an interesting comment in view of what's happening today. Indeed. Did you have siblings? I have a younger sister, 18 months younger. She lives in Manhattan. Really? So okay. we've left home years ago. And uh, where did you go to uh, undergraduate school? I went to undergraduate school at Rice University in Houston. What did you major in? Uh, mechanical engineering. And then you, uh, obviously, I've read some articles about you with respect to mechanical engineering. There came a point in time, I understand, when you decided engineering might not be the way you want to go. Critical juncture was my senior class in thermodynamics, and we did not get along, so uh, I headed to law school after that. Where did you go to law school? University of Texas in Austin. And when did you graduate law school? 1962. After you graduated law school, were you single or married? Uh, I was married. Uh, my wife, Flo, and I married uh, after my first year in law school. We had met at Rice. And uh, after her sophomore year, we married. And then she finished her education at the University of Texas in Austin. What was her degree in? In languages. So what brought you from... Texas to New Mexico? Uh, Trans-Texas Airways. Uh, as I was entering my last year in law school, I was interested in exploring new venues for the practice of law. Uh, a lot of pressure to go back to Houston, where both Flo and I had grown up. Uh, but because of my engineering background, the firms there were looking at me as uh, someone that they would place in their newly developing intellectual property, patent trademark sections, and I had clerked at the end of my first year of law school for a patent attorney, and though it was an interesting experience, uh, it was something that I did not see in my future, so I was looking for a, a place where I would still be able to preserve somewhat of a general practice, yet be associated with a firm that led me to the West, and uh, was concentrating on firms in Phoenix, but to get to Phoenix in those days to from Austin, Texas, you flew Trans-Texas Airways from Austin to Midland, Midland, Odessa, to Albuquerque, to Phoenix, and then reversed the process, so getting back home. So uh, on one weekend uh, in a trip to Phoenix, we stayed the weekend in Albuquerque where I had a cousin who was with the university. He suggested that I might like uh, the people in the firms here in Albuquerque. And so I basically I walked in and started talking to some lawyers in Albuquerque and became very interested in it. So when did you uh, take the bar here in New Mexico? Yeah, I took the bar in 1962 uh, after we moved here in the summer. At that point, you could take the bar exam right away, but you had to establish a six-month residency before you could be admitted to practice. So I was not admitted until uh, uh, 1960, January of 1963. Do you recall how many people took the bar with you at that time? I imagine there were a dozen. I can recall some names. Paul Matusi, for example, uh, Charlie Keeling, who's no longer with us, Joel Carson, uh, so I remember those because we all shared a motel room in Santa Fe. All the bar exams were held in Santa Fe at that time in the basement of the Supreme Court. So. And how quickly were they graded? Rather promptly. Uh, there weren't many applying for admission, so it didn't take long. And you then heard, but you had to sit out until your residency was That's established. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are you admitted in any other states other than New Mexico? In Texas. Uh, is there anything about your early childhood or early adolescence that influenced your decision to go into law, apart from the thermodynamics course? Uh, no, I would say not. Uh, my father uh, 
did not particularly think highly of lawyers, so I was not encouraged to head in that direction. Uh, he, what did he do? He was uh, a self-made businessman. Neither of my parents graduated from high school even. My father uh, had really two very interesting lives. He did not uh, marry until he was 43, and uh, you know, I was, he was 40, almost 45 when I was born. Uh, and he had some wonderful but totally different experiences in his lifetime. And, uh, you know, as I was raised, he was in the um, geophysical business uh, with a seismic company. And Doing what? Well, uh, seismic uh, exploration for oil and gas. And, okay. You know, they, in simple terms, they I understand. detonated dynamite and read the shock waves to determine where they are oil and gas was, and, that, uh, and it was with a company entitled uh, Independent Exploration Company in Houston. But they did quite a bit of work in the Middle East back at that really? time, mm -hmm. after World War II. So uh, nothing that uh, you didn't go into uh, oil and gas law? for? No, 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 I didn't. Okay. Uh, after you uh, started, uh, was it, were admitted here in New Mexico, where did you go to work? Well, uh, I worked, uh, I came to New Mexico with the Madro Law Firm, and I was there for 25 years before I became a judge. So The whole career. That was, yes, that was my practice. Now we're sitting here in the old federal courthouse in a beautiful courtroom that I understand has a little bit of significance for you. It what certainly is that? does, Tom. Uh, this is the courtroom in which I tried my first two jury trials. They were both criminal cases. Uh, I'm one of the dinosaurs that preceded the public defender systems, both in the federal and state courts. So in my first year of practice, I tried cases defending two people that had been charged in federal court with, with crimes. Um, the first one was quite interesting. It involved uh, two defendants. My client, a, a fellow who was quite a bit older than his younger girlfriend, Together they were charged with having stolen a social security check, about $200 worth, out of a lady's mailbox. And uh, the young woman co-defendant cashed the check at a bank while my client stood outside. Uh, they were on trial before Judge Payne, and interestingly, this is the old days, there wasn't a great deal uh, to do over in the U.S. Attorney's Office, so John Quinn, the U.S. Attorney, personally prosecuted the case, the $200 uh, Social Security check. I did quite well until the noon recess. Um, things were going well, but after lunch, Judge Payne told uh, John Quinn to call his next witness, and lo and behold, he called the co-defendant, to my surprise, uh, being a very young lawyer, and the this being my first trial, uh, I really didn't know what to do. And uh, as it turned out, over the lunch hour, my client had passed a note to the co-defendant, and uh, the co-defendant's attorney had made, and I forgot who that was, made an agreement with John Quinn, uh, and she was going to testify and produce the note in which my client said, uh, look, since I have a long criminal record and you've never uh, been convicted of anything, why don't you just tell the jury that this was all your idea and your fault and I didn't know anything about it. Well, the case changed dramatically after lunch, as you can see. <laughs> so, I understand that after that you uh, had somebody in your law firm that had been contacted by one of the jurors? One of the jurors became a good friend thereafter. I'd met him, not met him before the trial. It was Bobby Matusi. He used to have uh, own Matusi uh, shoes in Albuquerque. And uh, he had remarked to Jim Sperling, one of our senior lawyers, that uh, uh, there was a young lawyer in your office trying this case, and he did real well until lunchtime. <laughs> so. Tell us about your second trial. Second trial was in the same courtroom several months later, and it was quite interesting. It involved uh, charges that my client Joe Langston had illegally induced about a dozen 
uh, aliens to cross the border down by Columbus to go pick berries in Oregon. And uh, the government brought the 12 witnesses for the 12 different counts uh, and put them up at the old Hilton Hotel for a couple of weeks while we tried the case, at the end of which the jury acquitted Joe. And so I still have a memory of that trial from a little piece of art that Joe had drawn while the case was ongoing. Who was your judge in that case? Uh, judge Bratton was the judge in that case. Were there any particular professors uh, who inspired your educational or professional choices? Well, uh, certain ones stand out. Uh, High school teachers, English teacher, uh, uh, Miss London. Uh, You know, I still recall uh, old English. Juan that Aprila with the sure sota, the drought of March hath pierced to the rota. You know, the Canterbury Tales from back in Chaucer's times, things of that nature. There are a number who have made an impact. Uh, the one I tend to forget is the one who taught uh, thermodynamics that I did not learn. and That led you into law? And that led me to law, yes. All right. And there were a number of law school professors who were quite influential. I know you said you worked the Modrel firm your entire career as a practicing attorney. Yes. Uh, who do you feel was most inspirational to you at the Modrel firm? Well, Mr. Modrel at the firm, uh, and uh, then Jim Sperling and Joe Rail. But my real mentor there was Dan Sisk. He and I were closest. We've been very close friends over the years. We own a ranch together to this day in near Durango, Colorado, and are just uh, extremely close friends. And you met him when you first came to New Mexico? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, while you were in law school, what did you see your legal career being? Did you have any foresight? I really didn't. In law school, I was just fascinated by all of my courses. Uh, I just loved, loved the variety of law, and that entered into the decision to uh, look west instead of in Houston, where it was facing a rather narrow practice. And it was interesting. That was my experience in the early days of practice here in New Mexico. At the time I was interviewing in the early 60s, uh, there were two large firms. I think the Rody firm had at most 13 members. Modrel had 12. Uh, Iden and Johnson had a half a dozen. Uh, and at that point, uh, the specialization had not yet hit. And all of the firms had general practices and that was attractive to me. And I really got a dose of it for a period of about six months, probably the third year of my practice. uh, The associate lawyer with Modrill just ahead of me was uh, James Borland, the former U.S. attorney under President Eisenhower. He left the firm and for six months before Hank Coors joined us. I was the only associate lawyer with 10 partners. So you can imagine uh, the variety of work that I got to do. I was bankruptcy court one day, uh, traffic court the next, uh, you know, and anything that came up that one of the 10 or all of the 10 wanted to assign to me, that's what I did. What do you recall about cases that you handled early on in those days when you were a general practitioner? Any particular cases? There are a number that stand out. I'll relate one that's kind of amusing because it involved a well-known lawyer in town. Uh, Remember, one day Joe Rail came into my office and said, uh, I have a new client for you. Uh, He's waiting outside and I'll introduce you. So Joe brought Jim (sighs) Toulouse into my office and turned him over to me as, as a new client. And it was a very interesting case. You can read about it in New Mexico's reports. It went to the Supreme Court. Uh, Interesting part of the history of New Mexico, Colonel Fountain, who is one of the uh, historical figures in southern New Mexico, and who was murdered, and that led to an interesting murder trial in which Albert Lee was charged with a crime, 
uh, had painted historical forts in southern New Mexico. Uh, I think there were eight or ten of them, old Union forts. Colonel Fountain and Jim Toulouse's grandfather were good friends. And at some point, Colonel Fountain had given these paintings to um, Jim Toulouse's grandfather. They came down to the next generation without the benefit of a will or a, in being included as an asset in an estate. Jim Toulouse's father then uh, left the paintings to Jim, or he just acquired them when his father died. The families were very close, the Fountain family and the Toulouse family. There were three siblings of Jim's generation, two Fountain brothers and a sister who later uh, married Mr. Armendariz uh, from southern New Mexico. It's, the name is of significance there because it involved a huge ranch uh, on the east side of the Rio Grande. Well, in any event, they had been very close for years, and at one point, one of the brothers came to Jim and said that they wanted to put these paintings in an exhibit that they were um, arranging, and so Jim said, sure, and so they took the paintings and had them in this exhibit. Well, a few years later, Jim said, you know, I'd like to get those paintings back. And the response was, well, no, they were painted by our grandpa, <laughs> and they're not coming back to you. So we filed a replevin action to get the paintings returned. And excuse me just here. a moment. Can we break? Sure. Okay, I need to take this call. What's your, your microphone? Judge, we were talking a moment ago about, about the fountains and the uh, Armendaris Ranch and Jim Toulouse. Right. Let's well, in any event, uh, you know, I filed a replevin action on behalf of Jim. It was an interesting experience because he was a much more uh, experienced attorney than I was, so he's looking over my shoulder. We filed a motion for summary judgment supported by his affidavit that recounted what had occurred. And surprisingly, there was no uh, opposing affidavit. So Judge McManus, the judge assigned to the case at the time, he was on the district court bench at that point, uh, granted our motion for summary judgment. And the attorney for the Fountains and Ms. Armendaris appealed, and I don't recall who that was. Um, I could go back and look at New Mexico reports and tell you I should have done that for today. But in any event, uh, this is before the Court of Appeals had been formed, so it's a direct appeal to the New Mexico Supreme Court. Jim Toulouse and I drove up to Santa Fe together for the arguments, and it was in the afternoon, and I recall that we were the only case on the calendar. Uh, the bailiff opened, well, before that occurred, we arrived early, and the two Fountain brothers and Miss Armandaris were there. Jim Toulouse was still good friends of theirs. Uh, this was kind of a friendly fight in, an, in a way, and they were still buddies. So Jim introduced me to the two Fountain brothers and to Miss Armandaris, and we sat in the audience visiting. Uh, we were the only ones there. It wasn't a case of great interest to anyone except the litigants. Then the the uh, bailiff opened court, and in, in came the justices. I think Justice Compton, uh, I know Justice David Chavez was there, because he's a part of the story as it unfolds. And I don't recall the third, uh, but in any event, they came in, had a seat. Bailiff says everyone take their seats. So we sat down, and then Justice Chavez stood up and waves and says, well, hi, Miss Armandarius. Comes down from the bench, walks out, goes up to Miss Armandarius and gives her a big hug. <laughs> then he went back up on the bench. 
this is my first appearance before the New Mexico Supreme Court. <laughs> so, I'm turning to Jim Toulouse saying, you know, that, that this doesn't look exactly right. Well, the result, as you might guess, was that they reversed the summary judgment in Jim's favor. They could not find a disputed issue of fact because there was no opposing affidavit. The analysis was that he didn't say quite enough in his affidavit to support a summary judgment, so it came back, probably as it should have because they reached a very wise and uh, appropriate resolution. The Fountain Brothers and Miss Armandaris and Jim got together and agreed to put these paintings in a museum in Old Mesilla, where they are, I think, today. I haven't seen them recently, but I believe they're still there. So piece of New Mexico history. Yes, and one of my, well, my first appearance before the New Mexico Supreme Court, and uh, Are there, there any other the old days. Any other notable cases that you recall or areas of law that you got into and you ended up uh, in either the Supreme Court or an interesting courtroom drama that you involved, were involved with? I can, again, going way back, early practice, uh, and I would mentioned trying my first two jury trials in this courtroom in the federal uh, court. But in the state court, and this was before the state public defender system as well, uh, I was assigned quite a number of people to represent in the trial court. After a few years, you graduated to the appellate assignments. And there are two also in New Mexico reports that went Actually, one of them went to the newly formed Court of Appeals at that time. I think Judge Wood wrote the opinion. It was an interesting, simple case. Uh, the defendant, my client, was Tommy Sanchez, who was an ingenious fellow. He had a practice of sneaking into the Skid Row bars, which were down on 2nd Street, right across from the old Alvarado Hotel. And he would go in on days that the uh, workers who frequented those bars got paid, go into the men's restroom, and as the men were relieving themselves at the urinal, he would sneak up and swipe their billfold from their pockets and run out. Well, one day one of them caught him and tackled him out in the bar, so Tommy was then indicted, and uh, Judge Reedy was the judge. Marshall Martin was his defense attorney. And it didn't take long for the district attorney to present the case. I, I think Jim Brandenburg was the DA, but I don't know who prosecuted the case. I don't recall that. But in any event, uh, Tommy was charged with robbery. And during the noon hour, after all the evidence in was in, uh, Judge Reedy and Marshall and Tommy and Tommy's lawyer were sitting in the courtroom while the jury was at lunch uh, settling the jury instructions. Tommy said that he had to go to the bathroom. And so Judge Reedy said, well, don't take him down the hall. You'll have to put him in handcuffs and somebody might see him. Just take him into my bathroom and let him use the bathroom there. Judge Reedy's chambers were on the second floor of the old courthouse. And after about 15 minutes, the bailiff came back and said, Judge, the door's locked. I don't hear anything in the bathroom and I can't get in. So Judge Reedy said, well, you're going to have to get the door open. So they broke the door open. Tommy was long gone. He jumped out the second floor window. Poor Marshall Martin had to argue the case to the jury without his client sitting beside him. And needless to say, the jury convicted Tommy in absentia. Well, it was about three months later that Tommy, uh, driving while intoxicated, hit a tree in Corrales, so he's back in jail. And at that point, I was assigned to represent him on his appeal. And so we took the case to the newly formed Court of Appeals, and Judge Wood, being very technical, realized that he had been charged with the wrong crime because in committing the offense, there was no use of force 
force or threatened use of force. So he said robbery was the wrong charge and reversed the uh, conviction. So that successful appellate was, lawyer was Tommy is good. But my second one that uh, is another one that you would need to talk to John Robb about because he defended it at the trial level. This was Juan Jose Lopez, who was charged with uh, two counts of, of forcible rape along with some other related cases that involved rapes that took place this early in the same morning, same neighborhood, uh, right near the university. And one involved an 80-year-old victim. The other involved a college co-ed who lived about four houses down. Uh, the details don't come out in great detail in the appellate opinion, which is Supreme Court opinion. John Robb defended the uh, case, that, and then I was signed on the appeal, and did not get uh, Juan Jose Lopez off. <laughs> it was a very interesting case. Anything else that stands out in your mind? Any other cases when you were trying cases that was significant that you recall? I mean, after you were a young lawyer, when you were in the practice, any significant cases that you... Oh, there were a number. Uh, there was one in particular that was about a six-week trial, uh, and that was before Judge Rosier Sanchez. Paul Robinson uh, was a plaintiff's attorney, and it involved a uh, very serious injury case John Cooney and I were defending Kent Allen Construction Company in the case. Uh, they had put up a guardrail where Cole Avenue curves right before university. You can I know where still see the scene today, although the guardrail is different. There were 11, 11 steps in erecting the guardrail. Kent Allen got 10 of them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> very serious injuries and a very sad uh, case. The, uh, uh, what do you think your contributions were, looking at it uh, as a trial lawyer before you went on the bench? What do you feel your contributions were to the firm and to the, the New Mexico Bar? Well, to the firm, uh, as I indicated earlier, one of the attractions to the firm and to New Mexico, actually, was the ability to have a very general practice. So although I did a lot of trial work, it spread over a number of different areas uh, involved uh, probates, uh, divorces, for example. First three years, I did several divorces when partners came in and said, you know, I want you to do this for a friend of mine, et cetera. Uh, it, uh, a lot of amusing stories. Uh, I can remember trying a case before Judge Reedy on a Friday afternoon. Judge Reedy was known for his temper. Hugh Horn represented uh, the husband. Uh, I represented the uh, woman in the divorce who had, this is kind of interesting, I had actually first met her uh, when I handled the estate of her first husband. And she had inherited several rental properties around town, had then remarried without having followed my advice that if she ever intended to remarry, she needed to get a prenuptial agreement, but had not done that. Uh, her second husband, from whom she was seeking a divorce, had become annoyed at her snoring one time and dumped a scalding pot of coffee on her, blaming her because, uh, in his view, she intentionally went to sleep first so that she would snore and annoy him. And that was <laughs> his story. Uh, Hugh Horn realized he had a real difficult client, so we had lunch before this divorce trial began Friday afternoon, of all things, before Judge Reedy. He was very much concerned about Judge Reedy losing his temper on a Friday afternoon. So before the trial began, we went back and visited with Judge Reedy, and you explained that he would find Hugh's client to be rather difficult, but just try to be patient, and we would work through it. <laughs> well, 
as things turned out, I was cross-examining Hugh's client. He said something, and I don't even remember what it was now, but I lost my temper. <laughs> Hugh grabbed me, I remember that, and the next thing I remember was looking up and Judge Reading was just laughing so hard he was about to fall off out of his chair at the bench. <laughs> That's a funny story. Well, I don't believe that you're um, renowned for your divorce work from, what did you lay, uh, you were primarily involved in doing legal malpractice defense and yes, some other types. Yes, for you know, the last 10 years of my practice, a lot of medical malpractice, legal malpractice, some engineering malpractice defense work. Did you ever uh, intentionally shoot for becoming a federal district judge or any kind of a judge? Not really until I would say, you know, later on in my practice, uh, as I think many trial lawyers feel somewhat of a calling to that after a while, thinking that you can serve the public. My view of being a judge is it's a position of service and I intend always to abide by that view of it to try to help people resolve their disputes. Well, it's kind of interesting that both you and Frank Allen in the same law firm and basically uh, both trial lawyers ended up he on the state bench and you over here in the, right. the federal bench. Mm -hmm. That uh, you were uh, nominated by President Reagan. That's correct. And appointed when? 1987. And when did you take the bench? Right after that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as we're sitting here today in here, uh, can you tell me about any significant cases that you recall during your career on the bench, which has now spanned 22 years? Right. The first case that is still with me was made quite an impression on me. I was received an education in a field of which I had no knowledge, and that is uh, the field involving our developmentally disabled citizens. Uh, I began as a judge in November of 1987. The case had been filed, I believe, in the summer of 1987. Judge Bratton, uh, my mentor and predecessor in this position, uh, was still here in Albuquerque at the time. When I came on the bench, he moved to Las Cruces, and I inherited all of his cases. That case involved uh, a suit against the state of New Mexico and its two institutions at the time for the care of people who were developmentally disabled, and those were the Los Lunas Hospital and Training School at Los Lunas and the facility at Fort Stanton, New Mexico, down near Rodosa. The case took a lot of my time my first year on the bench, and actually the first month or two involved uh, a, an emergency hearing uh, with the named, first named plaintiff, Walter Stephen Jackson, became a class action case. Uh, Walter Stephen Jackson was 18 years old. He had a cognitive level of about 11 month old and his mother wanted him educated in the Los Lunas public schools. He was housed at the training center there. Later on, I realized the reason she wanted him in the public schools was not because she felt it would in any way be able to improve his cognitive level, but she felt that he was being physically abused severely at the training school and she wanted him out in the public on a daily basis so that he would be exposed to people outside the institution. And I finally understood that after getting into the case. As I indicated, the case was highly educational to me. I had really no experience with that segment of our uh, society and realized how vulnerable those citizens are uh, and felt that the result, although I didn't order that the institutions be closed, uh, the state eventually made that political decision and decided 
based on findings and rulings that I had made to care for the people in the class action in community settings as opposed to uh, institutions. So uh, over time, they then closed both uh, Los Lunas and Fort Stanton. You're still involved with those today? Still, I'm still in the remedial stage. I'm sure it'll go to my successor, whatever that occurs. What other significant cases. One that comes to mind is the Win Ho Lee case that was highly publicized. That's probably one of the more uh, publicized, highly publicized uh, criminal cases that I've handled. And it was a fascinating case. It took me back in part to my engineering days because I had to understand the physics and mathematics uh, underlying a part of the case. And uh, it was interesting to revisit mathematical principles that I had forgotten many years ago. Uh, I learned about classified information with which I had not had exposure prior to that. Logistically, it was a very difficult case to manage because only uh, those with Q clearances could uh, handle the documentation, or a lot of the documentation in the case. So my law clerk, Chris Baca, who is still with me, who uh, worked on the case with me, had to get a Q clearance. Federal judges automatically have Q clearances. Uh, my secretary had to get a Q clearance. There were problems. Uh, I abided by the rules, uh, which included, among other things, that if you're working with classified information, it's never to be out of your physical presence. So if I were reading a file with classified information, and I had to go to the bathroom, so did the file. And, it's, and uh, it presented problems in that we had to daily lock in a special safe all of the classified materials that we were using, which meant that I couldn't take any of it home with me, as had been my practice with a lot of cases. So it meant a lot of late nights at the courthouse uh, when I was working with the classified information. That went on for quite a while. Well, it was an interesting history. I got involved, you know, the case was originally assigned to uh, Judge Conway. And my first involvement was the appeal of Judge Fett's detention order. That came up in December of 1999. And that and it was Judge Conway's case at the time, but he was on an extended cruise of the South Pacific where he wanted to go over the international date line when we entered the new millennium of 2000. So he was gone. And I then, in his absence, heard the uh, appeal of the detention order that had been entered by Judge Fett. Well, at the time, Win Ho Lee's defense team had no information, so they were unable to counter a lot of what the U.S. attorney was able to present in terms of his dangerousness. And so I affirmed Judge uh, Svet's order of detention and kept him detained, although I was very troubled by the conditions under which Win Ho Lee was being held in a very small room in uh, shackles, all but an hour a day, and, uh, and it uh, just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, physically, I would see him at the courthouse. He maybe was five feet tall, uh, diminutive. Uh, he didn't look like a threat of any kind. And it, it troubled me greatly the way that he was being treated. I was then off the case for six months until June of 2000 when Judge uh, Conway recused, and, and then the case was reassigned to me. And it was after that uh, that several things happened. Uh, Bob Gorentz, who is an excellent trial lawyer, who knew the physics, the background, the nuclear weapons terminology well, had to withdraw from the case as well. So there was a new prosecutor, George Stambolides from New York, who was really scrambling to get up to speed, and the government was at a disadvantage at that time. There were certain rulings uh, that I made that required the disclosure of some classified information that 
was presenting problems to the government and eventually they worked out a plea agreement which was the resolution of the case finally in September. I do recall the comments you made to the to Mr. Lee in the conduct of the or I guess at the close mm -hmm. of the trial when uh, you apologized to him on behalf of the government. Well what was overlooked in that I started the comment to him by telling him that he had done wrong, that he had committed a felony to which he pled guilty, and that he did deserve to be punished. But my apology was about what had happened to him uh, in the manner in which he was held in custody, which I, in hindsight, think was just terrible. Uh, and our government should not have been doing that. And that was my concern. Let me ask you, uh, Judge, um, how has the bench, the federal bench, changed in your years on the bench? Well, at the time I came on board in November of 1987, that was a watershed month. November 1, 1987, was the effective date of the United States Sentencing Guidelines. Crimes committed after November 1, 1987 were crimes that then were under the United States Sentencing Guidelines as opposed to the prior federal parole system. It had abolished the parole system, so now you had guideline sentencing. The guideline sentences, particularly in the area of drug offenses, much more onerous than they had been prior to that. The consequence of that was an enormous shift of drug prosecutions from state court into federal court. The local, state, county law enforcement agencies immediately became aware that penalties in federal court for the drug crimes were going to be much stiffer. So all of the eight law enforcement agencies, not just federal, but all the state, local, city, were channeling the drug offenses of any significance into federal court. That created a rapid rise in the number of criminal cases in the District of New Mexico. It created an enormous workload for the judges at that time, who basically were Judge uh, Campos, Judge Berciaga, Judge Conway, and myself. A lot of these cases, as you might expect, were developing down at La, uh, Las Cruces. At the, that point, there was one part-time magistrate judge, a federal magistrate judge in Las Cruces, John Darden. Uh, judge Bratton had moved to Las Cruces, but it took a little while to come up to speed, and he was very helpful to us in handling criminal cases down there. But we were on the road virtually all the time going to Las Cruces for criminal trials and hearings. At that point, in the late 80s and the early 90s, the Fourth Amendment law had not been well developed in the Tenth Circuit, so we were having suppression hearings in virtually every case. And, uh, you know, it's many long nights. And How did our uh, volume of cases compare with other districts back in those days? At that point, as the cases were rapidly increasing in number, uh, this was true in all of the five border districts. There are 94 federal districts nationwide. Five of them border the Republic of Mexico, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Western Texas, and Southern Texas. At this point, uh, those five border districts out of the 94 federal districts nationwide handle about one-third of all of the felony crimes in federal court, which basically are drug crimes or immigration crimes. And it's simply because of the proximity to uh, the Republic of Mexico. Uh, in the last few statistical years, and our statistics basically are October 1, through the following September 30, the District of New Mexico has had the heaviest criminal caseload per judge of all the districts in the nation. 
uh, it's interesting that that doesn't necessarily mean that we have the largest number of criminal trials per judge because the system is so overwhelmed with cases that there is a need for the U.S. attorney to make special plea bargain officers that probably don't occur elsewhere. The border districts have what is called the fast track program authorized by the Department of Justice that gives uh, breaks in offense levels to uh, criminal defendants. And so the great volume of our criminal cases are disposed of by plea agreements. Did you uh, work in developing that system? Not directly. Uh, my main effort in the area of criminal law on a national scale, this was fascinating. I was on the Judicial Conference Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure, and for about four years of that experience, I was the chair of the subcommittee on style. And that doesn't style. mean the way you're dressed. It had to do with revising all of the federal rules of procedure. We started with the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure. Next were the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. And I, most of my efforts were on the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, but we completely restyled the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. So what you see in the books today uh, were a dramatic change from what preceded the year 2000. It, uh, quite different, and if you want to compare the two, I think you'll find our current federal rules of criminal procedure to be much more reader-friendly than they were before that stylistic revision. How long did that take you to the conference committee to do? The subcommittee that I chaired spent about two years on the project, and then our product was approved by the uh, uh, what is called the standing committee. It's the Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure, and then eventually the Judicial Conference under the Rules Enabling Process, then it goes to the Supreme Court, and then after the Supreme Court it goes to Congress, and uh, then it becomes effective. Nothing's ever simple. No. <laughs> uh, Judge, can you tell us a little bit about your family? Well, I have uh, two children. My wife died four years ago, and we were married uh, just short of 45 years. Uh, we met in college. And our children both live in Denver. Our son will be, uh, let's see, he'll be 48 this year, our daughter 46. Uh, our Are they son, in the law? No, our son went to one year of law school, but he had actually <clears throat> started an energy company in his senior year of college. and it, His grandfather carried through then. Uh, his grandfather had an influence, yes, I, I did. see. But uh, he is now the uh, chairman of the board of Delta Petroleum, which is a publicly traded company. The company he started as a senior in college uh, developed into this. Uh, our daughter had a very interesting educational experience. Uh, she started uh, college at the University of Colorado, where her brother was in school had a boyfriend in Albuquerque, begged to come home. Flo and I relented, and so she came back and finished at the University of New Mexico. The romance, by the way, lasted about a semester. And, uh, but she finished at the University of New Mexico. She was studying languages, uh, the same field that her mother had studied, but got fascinated by uh, a program that was being conducted at Jefferson Junior High, where she had been a student, and that was involved uh, uh, cardiac rehabilitation. And while at University of New Mexico studying languages, she worked there at the program uh, in the gym at uh, Jefferson Junior High. And then after graduating from the University of New Mexico, she sought out programs in the area of um, cardiac physiology. There were not many in the nation. They were kind of developing out of the 
fields of kinesiology, study of motion of the human body, but a broader scope. So she went to uh, Wake Forest, where there was a professor by the name of Paul Ribesel, who was the leader in that field at the time. I think there were only five universities in the nation that even had these programs. But it was associated with uh, Bowman Gray Medical School, Winston-Salem, and so Pam, our daughter, in her, while getting her master's degree, worked in this program of uh, cardiac rehab, and there, every time I see Wake Forest play in the old field house, that's where she did this. <laughs> I can remember seeing that, visiting her there. And then she, uh, after that, worked for Champion Paper Company, who had a young uh, CEO who was very much into physical fitness, and he had actually built a major exercise f facility at Champion Paper Company's main campus. She ran that program for a couple of years, but then wanted to pursue her education further, so she went to Arizona State University and worked at the Arizona Heart Institute while getting her PhD at uh, Arizona State. In what field? Well, their field was called exercise physiology, mm -hmm. but it, her emphasis was on cardiac physiology. It all blends together. But the interesting thing about her experience then, uh, after she got her PhD at Arizona State, she then joined the faculty at, where she started, uh, University, University of Colorado. Colorado at Boulder. So she was a research professor there for 10 years, and then she retired after that and to raise her family. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your primary interests outside of law? The New Mexico Symphony Orchestra is one of my main local interests. Uh, my wife, Flo, had been on the board for many years. She was on the board of uh, the American Symphony Orchestra League in a subcategory of that, very interested in uh, fundraising for the symphony and so on. I still, I, I'm prohibited as a federal judge from being engaged in fundraising, but I'm financially supportive of the symphony. I think it's one of the major uh, cultural, contributions. cultural contributions to this community. I mean, it's the New Mexico Symphony Orchestra. It's beyond just Albuquerque. It is a statewide and even regional orchestra of high repute. We're very fortunate to have uh, Guillermo Figueroa, the conductor of the orchestra. He's extremely talented, both as a conductor and as a violinist. violinist and. Uh, community is quite fortunate to have him, also Roger Malone, the choral conductor and assistant uh, symphony conductor. You never participated in music yourself no. as a musician? No, I've just enjoyed it. Over okay. the years. I understand you're also a fly fisherman. Yeah, oh yes, that's my, one of my great loves. Uh, skiing used to be until I broke my hip last season, so that, uh, I didn't get to ski this season, but I'm ho uh, hoping to do that next year maybe. Well, good. Judge, I'd like to uh, take a moment to talk a bit about your courtroom. Sure. Uh, I know you said you started your career here, but tell us a little bit about the courtroom. Uh, and then we'll, uh, there's some photographs or some paintings on the back wall. Right. Let me give you a history first. Uh, the building was built in 1930. At that time, there were no federal judges based in Albuquerque. And from statehood in, 2000, in 1912, until 1949, when Judge Hatch, whose portrait is in the corner over here, uh, was appointed by President Truman. And I should mention that Judge Hatch was a United States Senator Hatch before he became a district, federal district judge here in New Mexico. He is known, of course, for the Hatch Act that bears his name, governs political or prohibits political activity of federal employees, including federal judges. Uh, but uh, until he came on board, all of the federal judges had been based in Santa Fe. He's the first federal judge to use the chambers here in this courthouse. So from 1930 to 1949, 19 years, uh, there was no resident federal judge using this building. 
Uh, Why was Santa Fe the headquarters of the... Well, historically Santa Fe was the focus of state government and also uh, the federal law in the, in the, in the state. And Judge uh, Colin Nesbitt, probably the, the uh, most illustrious, uh, controversial, however you want to call him, uh, colorful uh, of all of us, uh, was based in Santa Fe, lived at La Fonda. Oh, really? He wasn't married. Uh, very interesting fellow. Uh, many stories about him. Uh, and uh, in any event, uh, you know, the judges in Santa Fe would hold court here, but they were based in Santa Fe, so they didn't have their primary uh, chambers in Albuquerque. So Judge Hatz is the first to be here, and his portrait is in the wall of on the wall of this courtroom because he was the first to use this courtroom regularly. And we can take a scan around the courtroom and you can explain to us what we're looking at. And I'd like the, and to see the behind your bench. Okay. All right, okay. on the far left. On the far left is the portrait of Judge Hatch, appointed by President Truman in 1949 and the first federal judge to use the chambers here as his regular chambers. Next to him is Judge Waldo Rogers, who was appointed by President Eisenhower. I believe he died in 1963. When I arrived in Albuquerque in 1962, he was still on the bench, but had uh, cancer, and I think I appeared before him only one time uh, for a sentencing or something, and I did not appear in his court very often. Uh, after Judge Rogers died, we'll go to the other side of the window, and you'll see Judge Verl Payne. Okay, Judge Payne, very interesting. If you look at that portrait, he probably projects the image that most people associate with a federal judge. Very distinguished looking, shock of white hair, an open law book. He is the last federal judge in the nation who did not graduate from a law school. Judge Payne went to law school for a year and then studied law in a lawyer's office, was admitted to the bar, was a state court judge, and was appointed to the bench by President Kennedy. It's an interesting juxtaposition with Judge Bratton, who is next to Judge Payne. Judge Bratton uh, was my mentor. Uh, I appeared before him a number of times as a practicing attorney. Always stood in awe of him. He was our precocious judge. He was 18 when he graduated from the University of New Mexico and entered Yale Law School as a teenager. Wow, didn't realize that. Yes, uh, he was then called into the Army and finished Yale Law School after his military service, practiced law in uh, Roswell, and was a regent uh, on the Board of Regents of the University of New Mexico. He was appointed to the bench by Judge, uh, excuse me, by President Lyndon Johnson. And the story goes, I haven't confirmed this, but the story goes that uh, Senator Clinton Anderson, let's see, he replaced Judge Rogers, who died. Judge uh, Payne had filled a newly created position. And the story goes that uh, Senator Anderson called uh, Bratton, then a practicing attorney, and said that he wanted him to be 
become the new district judge. And judge Bratton agreed and the process took less than a week to have him nominated by President Johnson and confirmed by the Senate. Less than and, a week? Uh, less than a week. <laughs> <laughs> which is certainly contrary to the experience judges are going through these days. That's true. <laughs> so anyway, that's an interesting story. And the portraits of these four district judges are hung in this historical courtroom because they are the judges who have had their chambers here in this courtroom. So tell us about the remodeling of this courtroom. What happened in 1964 when... Judge Payne and Judge uh, Bratton moved across the intersection to 500 Gold in the Brown Building on the other side of the, the intersection. This building no longer was used as a courthouse or courtroom. This courtroom was converted into office divided into a number of warrants, and I don't remember which federal agency used it. The ceiling was dropped to obey about the level of the wainscot. All of the uh, lamps, ceramic lamps, were removed and stored in a warehouse that the G uh, General Service Administration had in Winslow, Arizona. And this was simply used as office space from 1964 until 1978 when Judge Bratton returned to this building after it was restored at his behest. The story goes that it took a while to find these lamps that had been stored. Uh, they finally found them in the warehouse in Winslow one of them had broken, so one of these is not an original. One is a replica. I cannot tell you which one, and I would challenge you to try to determine which one it is because they all look the same to me anyway. But in any event, in 1978, Judge Bratton came back to the courthouse here at 421 Gold and uh, then was here until 1987 when he moved to, uh, when he took senior status I replaced him here, and he moved to Las Cruces. I was then here in 421 Gold from 1987 until 1998, when all of us moved to the new courthouse on Lomas, 333 Lomas. At that point, this courtroom and these chambers uh, were used by the bankruptcy court. Judge McFeely used the chambers on the sixth floor uh, Judge Stuart Rose, and then later Judge Tarzanski used fifth floor chambers. So you also, in your hallway here, have some significant artwork that we looked at earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to be happening with that artwork? Yes, the mural or murals on this floor, the sixth floor, were painted in 1937 by Earl Bistram, who was a noted New Mexico artist. He painted these murals under one of the Depression era federal work projects. Uh, his paintings normally were not murals. They were done simply because of the mural program of the federal government at the time. The main central panel of the three panels that are displayed here on the sixth floor are entitled uh, justice tempered by mercy, the central panel shows the judicial process. One of the side panels, and they're hung opposite to the way the artist intended, begins with a painting of two hands, one holding a knife, the other in a defensive posture, and that is strife, represents strife. The painting then takes you through the central panel, which is the judicial process, and you end up with a third panel of clasped hands, which is resolution. And that's the order in which the uh, artist Earl Bistram intended them to be displayed. These were painted for the original 
federal courthouse in Roswell, New Mexico, which no longer exists. It was torn down years ago. When it was torn down, the mur murals were sent to the Smithsonian in Washington. When this courtroom was restored in 1978, Judge Bratton, having been from Roswell, that's where he practiced, uh, knew of the paintings and he had the central panel, the main one, brought here and placed on the sixth floor right outside the entry to his chambers. It's kind of squeezed into a corner and not very well lit. In about 1988, Jessica Saus, our then clerk of the court, one day said, Judge, you know, there are some side panels that go with this. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And he said, I think I think they're still back at the Smithsonian. Would you like them out here? And I said, well, sure. We found an old photograph of the three panels, three murals, as they had been originally hung in the courthouse in Roswell. And I still have that photograph. So uh, Jessica South uh, had the side panels brought out. Unfortunately, they hung them in the wrong orientation. And I always felt that they really should be in the lobby of this building so that all entering would be able to see them. Now only those who come up to this floor get to see them. So the General Service Administration is currently undertaking a remodeling of the lobby. Uh, as you enter the building, no longer will you see the security equipment in the main lobby. It'll be in a side room. All entering will be diverted through the side room and through the security equipment, but the paintings here on the sixth floor will be hung in the lobby where everyone can see them, and I think that's a wonderful project. That's great. Uh, Judge, what would you like to see is in the future regarded as your most significant contribution to the law, where you are right now? Well, I think I alluded to it earlier. I, I see this position as a position of service. I hope that I'm remembered as a judge who helped litigants, lawyers, the public resolve under our system of justice some very contentious issues, both in the criminal law field and in the civil law field. Um, if I'm remembered as someone who helped guide them through that process to the proper resolution, that would satisfy me as a proper remembrance. How do you see the practice of law before you has changed since you took the bench? In the criminal area, The change has involved primarily a reduction in the number of criminal trials. In part, I think that's because the system has been overwhelmed by the number of cases. Uh, the U.S. Attorney, as you know, has brought a number, in recent years, brought a number of very high profile, very important public corru corruption cases. Uh, I tried the first of those, involved the case against Robert V. Hill, which ended in a hung jury and was retried by Judge Browning. Uh, so what you're seeing are some lengthy, important cases, but not as many of the smaller immigration drug cases of the nature that we used to try. In the civil area, it's kind of interesting. In recent years, it's shifted more from employment discrimination being the primary cases that went to trial to the excessive force wrongful arrest cases under Mary Chavez's policy of not settling those cases. So in the last few years, during which he's been mayor with that policy since uh, Mayor Baca. Uh, we've tried a great number of cases against the Albuquerque Police Department, and I would 
guess that that's probably about two-thirds of the civil cases that I now try. Really? In the last week of January, I tried two back-to-back. It was interesting. Joe Kennedy represented the plaintiff in each of the two cases. Kathy Levy defended the police officers in each of the two cases. We selected the two juries the same day and then tried the cases back-to-back. Did that come about through judicial economy determination, or how did that come about that you picked it? Just a timing issue. They were ripe for trial about the same time, and same lawyer, Joe Kennedy you know. and uh, Kathy Levy, who get along quite well, just decided we'd do them both the same week. And you got them done. What uh, words of wisdom would you pass along to young lawyers that might see these tapes? Well, first I will say to young lawyers that, that I'll extend a uh, bit of sympathy and apology to them. Uh, sympathy because they don't get to try cases as frequently as I did when I was a young lawyer. Uh, nowadays, for whatever reasons, it seems that young lawyers spend a lot more time in the discovery phase, document production phase, and seldom in the courtroom. Uh, if a long, young lawyer wants courtroom experience, I would suggest that they look to the criminal law practice, either with district attorney, federal or state public defender, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they would tend to get into court much more often than they would in a civil practice. Uh, that's probably your experience as well, I would imagine. It is. Uh, the So I, I, I extend a feeling of condolence to them because I think the ability to participate in trials is a wonderful and exciting experience that a lot of them will not have as frequently as I did, at least, as a young lawyer. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your career or uh, your time on the bench? Well, I do want to say that the practice of law has changed in this respect, and it's simply a function of the size of the bar. When I began practicing in the early 60s, virtually all of the lawyers in Albuquerque knew each other. It made, in a way, for a more congenial practice. Uh, there are a few outliers or outlanders who were recognized by the others as difficult to get along with. But in a general sense, everybody got along quite well, knew each other, trusted each other, uh, had uh, a good camaraderie, even though you may have oppose each other on a regular basis. I think that's lost over time simply because of the size of the bar at this point and the specialization that has occurred over time. One other point I'd like to cover with you is in our earlier discussion, we discussed one of your other law partners, uh, Dan Sisk. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a little bit about uh, Justice Sisk? He has an interesting career. Well, it goes back to his uh, law school days. Dan Sisk graduated from Albuquerque High School in 1944, joined the United States Navy, finished World War II in the Navy, and then after completing his undergrad studies at Stanford, entered the Stanford Law School class beginning in 1949, the class of 1949, or Fifty-two, depending on how you look at it, or 51, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Two of his classmates were William Rehnquist and Sandra Day O'Connor, Sandra Day at the time. Dan, after leaving the Navy, had enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserves because he was required to spend two weeks a year in the summer, uh, for which he was paid $50 a month, which was really a lot of income back at that time if you were a student. So he went to Stanford Law School with his classmates, William Rehnquist and Sandra Day, 
beginning in 1949 and completed two years of law school and was called up by the Marines for the Korean conflict and uh, had to leave law school. Was then in Korea for two years and then returned for his third year at Stanford Law School after uh, uh, William Rehnquist and Sandra Day had graduated already. But the trivia quiz is, who among the 1949 entering law school class at Stanford uh, was the first Supreme Court Justice? And the answer is uh, Dan Sisk. He was appointed by Governor Cargo to the New Mexico Supreme Court long before Chief Justice Rehnquist or Justice Sandra Day O'Connor became members of the United States Supreme Court. So. Well, I have no other further questions for you, Judge. I appreciate your time and your patience sitting through this today, and uh, we thank you for doing this and for your contributions to the bench and the bar. Well, Tom, thank you so much for affording me this opportunity, and I thank the uh, Bar Association as well, of course. It was an enjoyable experience, and I hope the young lawyers will learn something from it. Thank you.